Hey there, this is Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 11 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Hey there, welcome back. This is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and I am so excited about episode number 11 of Beginning Teacher Talk because we are talking today about eight things to do before you leave school for the summer, how to greatly reduce back-to-school stress. Now, I think you're going to love this episode because I'm all about sharing ways for you to work smarter, not harder. And if you haven't had a chance to check out last week's show, episode number 10, about 12 ways to leave school at school, why it's so hard and why it's so important, I really hope you'll go back and listen to that one too. Now, just imagine what it would be like if you could come back to your classroom in the fall and it was all ready for you. What if it was like you had some kind of a classroom fairy who came in and with the wave of her wand, you had all of your supplies neatly stocked, your teacher's desk was organized and hugely improved from last year, your first week plans were all done and photocopied and prepped, and your bulletin boards are beautiful and ready to go. Wouldn't that be awesome? Now, of course, there's no such thing as a classroom fairy, but if there were, I think we'd all be paying a lot of money for them to come visit our classrooms. (laughs) But this is the kind of thing you can do for yourself that you're actually absolutely going to love yourself for. I know because I used to do this for myself every year before I left for summer break. And when I came back to my classroom in the fall, I actually, I remember even starting to cry with gratitude for myself and the kindness I had shown to myself because of what I did to make back to school so much easier on myself. So what we're going to talk about today is one of those aspects of self-care that you actually can do for yourself that is still tied to teaching. I think we all need to start practicing ways we can be kinder to ourselves in this profession. So whether you're in your first year of teaching or you're in your 21st year, it's an ongoing struggle for us as teachers to take care of ourselves, right? We're really good at taking care of our students and doing all we can to ensure their happiness and their success. And I'd love to invite you, I know you hear this all the time, but If you're multitasking, come back to me for a second, because I'd really love to invite you to think about shining that amazing light inward for just a little while and giving yourself even just a bit of the sunshine you spend every day pouring into those lucky kids. So I'd encourage you to be your own best friend just in this way for now to get started and give yourself the incredible gift of thinking ahead to make coming back to school in the fall just a little easier. So here are the eight things that I always did and that you can do too. I didn't always do this, by the way. I started out not doing this for myself and it was so chaotic coming back to my classroom every year that I learned to do this. And I want you to cut out that whole learning curve. I mean, there's no need for you to go through that yourself. Honestly, if you can do these eight things before you leave school in the summer, um, you're really going to reduce your back to school stress. So let's get started. Okay. Number one, I would go through my entire classroom in June, if if your school year ends in June, and make a list of what I would need for next year. That way over the summer or when back to school sales hit in August, they're even starting in July now, I wouldn't have to try to remember what I needed. I would already have my list of, okay, these these are the things my classroom is low on and I need to remember to buy. So I would post this list on the side of my filing cabinet or somewhere where I would easily be able to find it when those late summer flyers and specials come out. So whatever you, wherever you can post your list that you won't lose it. Maybe you want to even put it onto your phone in notes, whatever works for you. Don't, you know, just keep putting it somewhere you won't lose it. 
Um, secondly, I took down all of my bulletin boards and I used my students' help for this. So I'll talk about that. And I created stress-free bulletin boards for the next year. This again was a learning curve and I want you to skip over the whole learning curve and I'm just going to give it to you straight how awesomely and simply you can run your classroom without spending a lot of time on your bulletin boards. Okay. So first of all, I talk about how I enlist the help of my students to take down my bulletin boards in episode number eight. Um, and in that episode, I shared 25 fun and easy ways to manage spring fever in my classroom. <laughs> But really, if you just show responsible pairs of students, I mean, you have to kind of be careful who you ask to do this because we all know that there are all different brands of special in your classroom. <laughs> so some of them can't handle the responsibility of a staple remover and you probably have a lawsuit. So just choose the students that you know can handle this responsibility, show them how to use a staple remover and teach them to ensure that if any staples fall, they catch them and then they can take down the student work and put them in their, your student mailbox. It's, it's a really easy job for them to do and they just love it. Now, even if your school doesn't allow you to leave anything on the walls over the summer break, which I think is such a stupid rule, but anyway, if your school doesn't allow you to, I always had all of my bulletin boards planned out before I left for the summer and ready to go so that in the fall, all I had to do was just put them up, which is one less thing I had to think about and plan when I headed back to school with summer brain, because we all know we get summer brain. Now, too often I see beginning teachers putting so much time and effort into creating the Pinterest worthy classroom. And I love a cute classroom as much as you do. Believe me, if you saw my house, I love creating beautiful spaces. I just, it's, I, I think there's something about being an elementary teacher too. We just love to create beautiful spaces, but you can do this smart. Does that even make sense? You can do this in a smart way. You don't have to do it by spending so many hours. So we're going to talk more about thinking about ways you can get smarter about how to use your time decorating your classroom. So I'm planning another awesome episode about how to create the best classroom theme ever while having a whole lot of fun and reducing your workload. So watch out for that one because it'll be coming up soon. Now, one way that I always had back to school bulletin boards instantly ready for next year, oh, you're going to love this. It's so much fun, is to invite my current students to write letters to next year's class. So my current students really enjoyed telling future students what they loved about being in my classroom. Um, I always ask them to give some advice of what they need to be careful of, which is so funny. I mean, they would refer back to times that they'd gotten in trouble and what they need to to be careful of as for new students coming in, you know, don't do this because Mrs. Friesen will do this or whatever. It is. It's so cute. Um, and then they, we talk about some of the highlights of the year in their letters, field trips we took, subjects or topics of study they loved, or even, and they love talking about this, awesome rewards that they can work for in my classroom or in your classroom. And then I would put these letters on display at the beginning of the school year for next year's class. And it's such a wonderful way to welcome in new students. And it helps to reinforce the expectations that I'll be teaching them that first week of school, all while giving me an instant bulletin board at the beginning of the school year. So I want you to think about how you can make your bulletin boards as simple as possible so you aren't changing them often and creating extra work for yourself throughout the year. Now, in all my work with teachers, I hear them say things like, I need to come up with an awesome idea for my April bulletin board. And I shake my head because there is just no need for an April bulletin board. April, my friends, is for spending gorgeous spring Saturday afternoons going out for lunch on a patio somewhere and shopping with your girlfriends. That's what Saturday afternoons are for. They are not for spending your afternoon cutting out laminated raindrops and figuring out how to get the words April shower straight on your bulletin board. There's no need for this if you get smarter about how you do your bulletin boards. So let's get your life back. So for example, in my classroom, I had a permanently dedicated space for student job boards, rules and expectations, the daily schedule, I, I mean, and several other ideas, but these are permanent, useful, interactive bulletin boards. So keeping just one bulletin board in my classroom dedicated to displaying student work makes managing my bulletin, bulletin boards pretty easy 
And it helps to keep my classroom running really smoothly and easily because every other bulletin board or space on the wall of my classroom is dedicated to an interactive space where students use it every day for another aspect of managing the classroom. So I think I'm going to do an entire show all about how to make bulletin board management super easy, meaningful, and interactive because it really does make a huge difference. It's not just, your walls should not just be a decoration. They actually should be used every day. So I'm going to get out my, off my soapbox there, but okay. Number three, if you need to move classrooms, oh my gosh, you might be horrified to know I had to move not only classrooms, but grade levels every year during my first three years of teaching. It was horrible. There's got to be I mean, there should be a law against that, right? Like principals should not be allowed to do that to beginning teachers. But wow, I learned a lot. So what I learned to do is to take pictures of everything before I packed it up. So I could remember exactly how I had organized it if it worked well for me. And if it didn't work well for me, I would take pictures and write notes to myself about how I wanted to set it up differently the next year, because I would completely forget otherwise. So again, just like my back to school shopping list, I would post this list wherever I knew I'd be able to find it again easily. Because it's amazing how our minds just forget all those little details once we're in summer break. Uh, But I really didn't want to repeat the same mistakes in the following year. So that worked out really well for me. Now, fourth, I organized all of my digital files. This is a big one. You know that expression, a cluttered space leads to a cluttered mind? It's really weird how when I clean things up, like even digital files and declutter my computer, it helps me to feel like I can truly have a fresh start the next year. So what works well for me is I created one folder labeled for this school year and put, I put everything into that one that I might need in terms of student information and files. And then I create a new folder for the next school year and duplicate anything I'll need, but need to keep separate. So I keep a fresh brand new file just for this next school year. And I would then, this is a big one, I would organize and delete old emails So I learned to take the time to do this at the end of the school year so I could come back completely fresh in the fall. And I don't know if you're like me, but again, with email, I literally feel the weight of it. If you see that you have like 15,000 emails, (laughs) a cluttered space leads to a cluttered mind. And it really feels true. Now, and there's nothing worse, by the way, than coming back to a fresh new year. And the first thing you see is a nasty old email from one of those parents that you're happy to not see in your classroom this year. Oh my gosh, that's another episode, right? We need to talk about that one. We could talk for days about parents and I have a feeling we probably will because I have some great ideas for you um, about how to get your par- those parents all on your side. It's really fun. Okay, number five, I would do a deep clean, uh, classroom cleaning with my students. And again, episode eight, I talk more in detail about how I did this. Now, of course, we have janitors and custodians at our school, right? But taking the extra time and care to leave my classroom space beautiful and requiring less effort for the custodial staff went a long way towards gaining favor for when I really needed their help later in the year. And you might not have had this happen yet, but you will. Like when that kid throws up and you really need their assistance immediately, If you've done little things like this for them, they remember your acts of kindness and they're more than willing to help you when you really need them. It's just like any other relationship, right? If you treat them well, then what you give out comes back to you. So I used to have my class do a deep clean as an act of kindness. We didn't have to do it, but we would clean the classroom really thoroughly. And then we would leave thank you notes for the custodial staff one day on the last week of school. So doing that not only gained favor with my custodian, which was great, but it also taught my students a valuable lesson about thinking about others, about gratitude, and about respecting the hard work that the custodians do to keep our school beautiful and clean. So um, that was something I always did towards the end of the school year, and I know that they really appreciated it. Number six, I prepared my first week of school plans. Now I know this sounds weird, but I actually find that preparing for back to school week at the end of the year for the following fall, much easier 
than when I tried to do it in the fall after a long summer break because I was already used to planning every week. You know, you're kind of in the hamster wheel. You're ready. You're used to planning and you're used to doing this every single week. And so it's just amazing how quick and effortless it felt to do this in the summer, like just before the summer, than to try to do it in the fall. Everything takes me like five times longer when I come back to school in the fall. So I, in the last week of school, I would plan just as if it was the first week of school the following week. It's just one more week in the school year, but then you have a jump start on the fall when so many of your colleagues are going to be dragging and when there's a long line at the photocopier and, you know, when it's really hard to actually get into it. And believe me, you're going to be so grateful to yourself when you come back in the fall and you have everything photocopied and prepared for your first week back at school. So gather all the supplies you'll need, including books and resources, do all of your copying for the first week and put it all in a box or a plastic bin, clearly labeled the first week of school. And if there are any things you will still need to buy or get that are consumable, put a bright sticky note on top of everything with a list of whatever else you need that you haven't gotten yet. So that way, when you come back in August or September with summer brain, you won't need to think too hard to get back into the swing of things. Oh, that was one of my favorite things. I highly recommend you do this. Okay. Number seven, this is going to feel like something you absolutely don't want to do, but please hear me again. If you're multitasking, come back to me because this is really important. I prepared emergency sub plans for next year. Okay. So I had developed a huge substitute binder folder over the years that I was teaching and I could just pull from whenever I was sick. So I highly recommend that you get intentional about developing a substitute teacher station or binder now while you're healthy. This was another one of those moments when I suddenly came down with the flu or a sinus infection that I was so grateful to myself for taking the time to prepare these sub plans in advance. And I learned my lesson the hard way. I hope you haven't had this happen to you, but you might have. We all seem to have to go through this again skip the learning curve and just jump to the awesomeness. <laughs> but I learned my lesson the hard way. I remember when I was only teaching half time in my first year and I came down with a really nasty cold. I think I had a sinus infection. I always seem to get a sinus infection and it took me, this is, you're going to laugh. It took me two hours to plan for a sub for two hours of teaching because I was so sick. I couldn't even think straight, which, so it took me so much longer to plan something um, because I was sick already. So don't ever do that. The great thing is we are living in a fantastic age. There are so many great resources you can check out on Teachers Pay Teachers that offer ready-made subplan folders. So there's no need to recreate the wheel or put too much effort into this. Just spend an hour or so now while you're healthy searching for highly reviewed sub plans that you think will work for you and get that resource right away and tuck it away and make sure it's ready to go. I've linked to several that I think you're going to love in the show notes um, for this episode at drlauriefriesen.com to help you get started. So go over there and check that out as soon as um, we hop off this episode. And number eight, finally, I would prepare next year's student folders and homework packets. So whatever you use or plan to use to send student homework every day in, in my classroom, I had a clear plastic folder for each of my students in which they kept their agendas, their communication books for parents. Um, I'll talk about those when I talk about communication with parents. So valuable. They would keep their agendas or communication books for parents, daily homework. If you send daily homework, um, and they can all be prepared in advance and placed in your back to school bin. So all you need to do when you come back in the fall is put your students' names on them and you're ready to go when you come back in the fall. And especially if you're planning as a team in your grade level, think about preparing and photocopying next year's homework packets now so they're ready to go in the fall. All right, that's it. I hope that hearing about how I was super intentional about planning for my next year really helped me to get off to a great start in the fall. And if you're listening to this episode in the gym or if you're in the car and you weren't able to take any notes, go ahead and grab the show notes on my website, drlauriefriesen.com for episode number 11. So let's do a quick review of the eight things you need to do before leaving for summer break. Um, number one, make a list of supplies you'll need for the fall and put it somewhere where you will not lose it. <laughs> Number two, prepare easy, 
bulletin boards for next year. So be super smart about this. Number three, take pictures of how you organized supplies and spaces before you pack it all up. And again, uh, take notes for improvements you want to make and place that in the same place as your list of supplies so you don't lose it. Number four, organize and declutter your digital files and your email. You do not want to come back to a nasty email from anybody when you're fresh in the fall. (laughs) Number five, do a deep classroom cleaning. And I highly recommend you write notes of gratitude to your custodial staff. Number six, prepare your first week of school plans and, you know, get all that photocopied and ready and put it in a bin. Number seven, prepare emergency sub plans for the year. Again, on Teachers Pay Teachers, I've linked to a few great um, resources for you. And number eight, prepare folders or homework packets for the next year if you plan to do this. Okay. And that's it. Now, if you're getting great value from this podcast and you're feeling extra loving, I would so appreciate it if you would be willing to leave a review for me in iTunes. And remember, just because you are a beginning teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I hope you have a wonderful week and I can't wait to connect with you again soon. Bye for now. 